So welcome everyone. This is study group with Venerable Yutada Mobiko. Today we are starting to study the Visudimaga. Um, and we, I mean, I, I was thinking of some rules that we could implement uh, during these studies. So I guess the first thing I would like to <laughs> everyone to just keep in mind to not to over talk uh, each other. Just uh, try to use a good microphone. Uh, also, um, if there is a question, please wait until Bante can respond. And then if there is like two, three seconds of silence, you can say whatever you wish to say. Um, let us know if you have a question uh, in the in the chat. So if if you have a question uh, related to the text, uh, what we are actually learning, then uh, just keep just say that I have a question and I will give you time to uh, to ask your question, and then Bante can answer. Um, I was thinking maybe uh, we can read two paragraphs or half a page. One person could read a half a page. And then uh, also let me know if you can't read and you want to be skipped. I'll try to keep in mind who asked that. So first, uh, also, if someone asks their question in the chat, please don't try to answer the question. Uh, give room for Bante to answer it first. And then that's it that I was just thinking about. And uh, let's start with uh, taking the precepts. Uh, is there anyone who would like to um, read the precepts today, or should I do it? So I'm setting the channel to private during the precepts. Taking the precepts is a formal affair and should be interrupted. So no one will be able to join the channel during the taking of the precepts. Ahang Bante, Tisara Nina. Saha pancha silani achami. Dutiampi ahang bante. Tisaranina saha pancha silani achami. Tatiampi ahang bante. Tisaranina saha pancha silani achami. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambudasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambhadhasa. 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 Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Buddhang saranang gachami. Buddhang saranang gachami. Dhammang saranang gachami. Dhammang saranang gachami. Sanghang saranang gachami. Sanghang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. 
Sati Ampi Dhammang Saranang Gatsami. Sati Ampi Dhammang Saranang Gatsami. Sati Ampi Sanghang Saranang Gatsami. Tatiyampi Sanghang Saranang Gachami. E Saranagamanang Nitintang. Ama Bante. Parnati Pata Ve Ramani Sikhapadang Samadhyami. Parnati Pata Ve Ramani Sikhapadang Samadhyami. Adinna dana ve ramani sikha padang samadhyami. Adinna dana ve ramani sikha padang samadhyami. Ramesu mitha chara ve ramani sikha padang samadhyami. Kamesu mitha chara. Veramani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Musavata Veramani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Musavata Veramani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Urami Raya Manja Pamadakana Veramani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Sura Miraya Madja Pamadatana Veramani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Emani Pancha Sikha Padani Selena Sugating Yanti Selena Boga Sampada Selena Nibuting Yanti Pasma Si Dang Sodha Yim Sadhu, 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 Page 63. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arhato Sama Sambuddhasa. Chapter 1. Description of Virtue. Sila Nidesa. Introduction. When a wise man established well in virtue, develops consciousness and understanding, then as a bhikkhu, ardent and sagacious, he succeeds in disentangling this tangle. This was said, but why was it said? While the Blessed One was living as Sawati, it seems a certain deity came to him in the night, and in order to do away with his doubts, he asked this question. The inner tangle and the outer tangle this generation is entangled in a tangle. And so I ask of Gotama this question. Who succeeds in disentangling this tangle? Okay, so just one note on the word consciousness. It's probably not the best translation. There isn't a really good translation. The word is jitta. Jitta means literally the mind. Right? It's the most common word used to, to refer to the mental aspect of existence but here it has actually a specific meaning that you won't get if you translate as consciousness it's referring to samadhi concentration so it's actually um uh, it's a specific usage of the word jitta to mean like adi jitta you hear the buddha say which means high mindedness so it's like you can say it like you develop your mind that's why it's used in this way, but it actually means con uh, concentration because this verse is referring to the three trainings, which is why he's using this verse. He's going to show how this verse, or he's going to use this verse as a reminder of the importance of the three trainings and then therefore use the three trainings as uh, an outline for this text. So the second, the first, um, the first section, what does he call it? The first. Uh, I don't have it here, but the first part is called Sila, the Sila section. And uh, the second part is called the, the Samadhi section, I guess is what it's called. Yeah, Samadhi Nidesa, I guess, right? So it is the Nidesa, Sila Nidesa, Samadhi Nidesa, and Panya Nidesa. 
So Samadhi Nidesa is, is based on the Jitta part. So that's what the word there means. Just just as a explanation of why this verse is so important that you miss if you transmit it as a consciousness. Is it, is it weird to say even in English did it develops consciousness? Develops the mind. Yeah. Yeah, there's not really a good translation, but yeah. Uh, it's an odd choice of translation. I think the Anamoli was, um, to some extent, keen on using one word, one translation. So for every Pali word, to always use the same translation. I'm not sure if we're going to see that in this text or not. But the word there is jitta, which it's a very different, very specific uh, meaning of the word jitta, referring to concentration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Paragraph two. Here is the meaning in brief. Tangle is a term for the network <clears throat> of craving, for that is a tangle in the sense of lacking together, like the tangle called network of branches in bamboo thickets, etc. Because it goes on arising again and again, up and down among the objects of consciousness, beginning with what is visible. But it is called the inner tangle and the outer tangle because it arises as craving for one's own re requisites and another's, for one's own person and another's, and for the internal and external basis for consciousness. Since it arises in this way, this generation is entangled in a tangle, as the bamboos, etc., are entangled by the bamboo tangle, etc., so to this generation, in other words, this order of living beings, is all entangled by the tangle of craving. The meaning is that it is intertwined, interlaced by it. And because it is entangled like this, so I ask of Gautama this question, that is why I ask this. He addressed the Blessed One by his clan name as Gautama who succeeds in disentangling this tangle, who may disentangle this tangle that keeps the three kinds of existence entangled in this way? What he asks is, who is capable of disentangling it? Three. However, when questioned thus, the Blessed One, whose knowledge of all things is input, inputted, deity of deities, excelling Saka, of, ruler of gods, excelling Brahma, fearless in the possession of four kinds of perfect confidence, wielder of the ten powers, all seer of unobstructed knowledge, uttered this stanza in reply to explain the meaning. When a wise man, established well in virtue, develops consciousness and understanding, then as a bhikkhu ardent and sagacious, he succeeds in disentangling this tangle. My task now is to set out the true sense, divided into virtue and the rest, of the same verse composed by the great sage. There are here in the victor's dispensation, seekers gone forth from home to homelessness, and who, although desiring purity, have no right knowledge of the sure straight way comprising virtue and the other two, right hard to find, that leads to purity, who, though they strive here to gain no purity, to them I shall expound the completing path of purification, pure in expositions, relying on the teaching of the dwellers in the great monastery. Let all those good men who do desire purity listen intently to my exposition. Herein, purification should be understood as Nibbana, which, being devoid of all stains, is utterly pure. The path of purification is the path of that purification. It is the means of approach that is called the path. The meaning is, I shall expound that path of purification. So, 
I I do have a question in regards to I think the second paragraph where it's mentioned that three existences are interlaced. Uh, is it the past, present, and the future? And how is this deity? I mean, do they know already know the Paticca Samupada or what's happening? Yeah, I looked for that as well, and I don't actually see it in the Pali. I see Te Datuka. It doesn't mean what I think he's trying to make it mean. So already I'm not sure about the translation. I don't think I've ever looked at the Pali for this, but uh, I mean, if it was the three, what does he say? The three, three kinds of existence. Uh, it would probably be the three realms of the Gama Vachara, Rupa Vachara, Arupa Vachara, mm. Gama Bhumi, Rupa Bhumi, uh, and the Rupa Bhumi. So. I mean, it's just all existence, but it doesn't say that. It says, Te Datukang, having been entangled, right, the three, the three, yeah, Ewang, Te Datukang. Yeah, maybe it does mean that. Maybe it does mean what he, he's, he's a far better at Pali than I am, so he may very well mean what he, Ewang, Ewang, Te Datukang, Chatitwa. Yeah, no, I'm I'm just gonna go by what he said because I don't know any better. I've never heard of it called the three datus. Well, one thing I wanted to note just briefly, and also in the second paragraph, I think it's like there's gonna be a lot of things that require in in this text you'll see there's gonna be a lot that requires background knowledge. He's not going to spell everything out and it's expected that you have a basic knowledge of Buddhism. This is a, this is um, quite a different sort of text than what we previously read in the Majjhima Nikaya, right? Where it sometimes talks to people who aren't even Buddhist. Well, this text uh, assumes that you have, that its readers have actually sometimes quite an in-depth understanding of the Dhamma. So where he says, for example, among the objects beginning with what is visible, you have to understand that that kind of uh, expression means the six kinds of uh, objects of consciousness. So what he's saying is that craving arises based on all of the six senses, basically, to put it simply. Seeing can cause, what is visible can trigger craving, what is audible, the sounds can trigger craving. When you hear something you like, or something you want, something you want to get rid of. Smelling, tasting, feeling, and thinking. Thinking can lead to craving as well. But he says it, there'll be lots of things like that where it, if you're not sharp, you won't catch that what he's talking about. Where he says, among the objects of consciousness, beginning with what is visible, means the six senses. So he just says, uh, what he's saying is seeing, etc. Six. In some instances, this path of purification is taught by insight alone, according as it is said. Formations are all impermanent. When he sees thus with understanding and turns away from what is ill, that is the path to purity. Dhammapada 277 And in some instances, by jhana and understanding, according as it is said, he is near unto Nibbana, in whom are jhana and understanding. Dhammapada 372. And in some instances, by deeds, kama, etc., according as it is said, by deeds, ver vision, and righteousness, by virtue, the sublimest life, by these are mortals purified, and not by lineage and wealth. And in some instances, by virtue, etc., according as it is said, he who is possessed of constant virtue, who has understanding and is concentrated, who is strenuous and diligent as well, will cross the flood so difficult to cross. 
and in some instances by the foundations of mindfulness, etc., according as it is said, Bhikkhus, this path is the only way for the purification of beings, for the realization of Nibbana, that is to say, the four foundations of mindfulness. And similarly, in the case of the right efforts and so on. But in the answer to this question, it is taught by virtue and the other two. 7. Here is a brief commentary on the stanza, established well in virtue, standing on virtue. It is only one actually fulfilling virtue who is here said to stand on virtue. So the meaning here is, it, is this being established well in virtue by fulfilling virtue. A man, a living being, wise, possessing the kind of understanding that is born of karma by means of a rebirth linking with triple root cause, develops consciousness and understanding, develops both concentration and insight. For it is concentration that is described here under the heading of consciousness and insight under that of understanding. Ardent, atapin, possessing energy. For it is energy that is called ardor, atapa. In this, in the se sense of burning up and consuming, atapana, paritap, paritapana, defilements. He has that, thus he is ardent. Sages, sages, it is understanding that is called sagacity. Possessing that is the meaning. This word shows protective understanding. For understanding is mentioned three times in the reply to the, to the question. Herein, the first is naive understanding. The second is understanding consisting in insight while the third is protective understanding that gu guides all affairs. He sees fear, I am ikati. In the round of rebirth, rebirth, thus he is a bhikkhu. He succeeds in disentangling the tangle. Just as a man standing on the ground and taking up a well-sharpened knife might disentangle a grand, great tangle of bamboos, so too he, this bhikkhu who possesses the six things, namely this virtue and this concentration described under the heading of consciousness and this threefold understanding and this order, standing on the ground of virtue and taking up with the hand of protective understanding exerted by the power of energy, the knife of insight, understanding well sharpened on the stone of concentration might disentangle, cut away, and demolish all the tangle of craving that had overgrown his own life's continuity. But it is at the moment of the path that he is said to be disentangling that tangle. At the moment of fruition, he has disentangled the tangle and is worthy of the highest offerings in the world with its deities. That is what the Blessed One said. When a wise man, established well in virtue, develops consciousness and understanding, then as a bhikkhu, ardent and sages, he succeeds in disentangling this tangle. So the moment of the path is um, the moment, this might not be familiar to everyone, the moment of the path here is uh, just one mind moment. It's called the path for that specific reason. It's actually the same nature of consciousness as fruition and they both refer to the experience of nibbana or the, the realization of nibbana but the first moment is distinguished because it's only that moment that um leads to the the uh, non-existence of defilement because it only takes one moment that's why so it's distinguished because all it takes is one moment and the rest are just extra fruition so that's just referring to that moment and fruition is referring to the moments after that that also entail the experience of nibbana 
is here here uh, referring specifically specifically to the Arahant Bhante because he mentions uh, being worthy of offerings. No, all eight people, all eight noble ones are worthy of offerings. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily just uh, the Arahant. Though I suppose the one who completely disentangle disentangles the tangle is the Arahant. Another thing to note here is the word insight uh, is a translation of the word vipassana, which I would prefer again to translate as uh, seeing clearly or clear vision or something like that. That's how we translate it. And also the word virtue, if that's not familiar to everyone, it's a translation of the word sila, which might better be, might could also be translated as ethics. The problem with the word virtue is because Technically, like wisdom is a virtue, right? So it's confusing. But when he uses the word virtue here, he means sila, which is behavior or ethics or ethical behavior. Ethics may be the best translation. Morality is another one. I have a question about triple root cause. Triple root cause is anger, greed, and delusion? Or? No. Non greed, non anger, and non delusion. In this case, okay, that's Abhidhamma, and he's going to refer to the Abhidhamma from time to time. I don't think we. There's another study group for that. I don't think we have to go into too much detail about it. Thank you. So I I wanted to ask you, Bante, if you could uh, give like just the lightest example for these three types of understandings. The first is naive understanding. Second is understanding consisting in insight. I think that I understand. And what would be the protective understanding that guides all affairs? I don't know. I've never really heard of these. I mean, I think naive understanding is still some, I mean, just understanding, right? It's still wisdom. Just, I don't understand how is that for naive. Understanding is mentioned three times in the reply to the question. It's not naive. Naive is, I don't think, the right term. I think it just means like pure understanding or just understanding as understanding. Mm -hmm. Eight. Herein, there is nothing for him to do about the naive understanding on account of which he is called wise. For that has been established in him simply by the influence of previous karma. But the words ardent and sagacious means that by preserving with energy of the kind here described and by acting in full awareness with understanding he should, Having become well established in virtue, develop this, uh, this, the serenity and insight that are described as concentration and understanding. This is how the Blessed One shows the path of purification under the headings of virtue, concentration, and understanding there. Okay, I found the trans. I found the word for naive. I wonder if it's a transcription error because it probably means to say native wisdom because it's jati panya, which again is referring, I think, to the wisdom of being born someone who has triple rooted consciousness means is born with wisdom. Yeah, I believe that is the case uh, since to uh, attain any. Uh, uh, progress or how progress in insight you would have to be born with the triple rooted karma so maybe that is why it is called basic like maybe basic understanding i also have the german translation of the same um, from the, one of the students and he also says the your mind you're born with right so it's probably what you said Dante. Uh, just wrong letters, it should mean native or something like that. Nine. What has been shown so far is the three trainings, the dispensation that is good in three ways, 
the necessary condition for the threefold clear vision, etc. The avoidance of the two extremes and the cultivation of the middle way, the means to surmounting the states of lust, etc. The abandoning of defilement in three aspects, prevention of transgression, etc. Purification from the three kinds of defilements and the reason for the states of stream anti and so on. How? Here the training of higher virtue is shown by virtue. The training of higher consciousness by concentration and the training of higher understanding by understanding. The dispensation's goodness in the beginning is shown by virtue because of the passage, quote, and what is the beginning of profitable things? Virtue that is quite purified. Uh, actually, I'm not sure. Is this the Samyutanikaya? And because of the passage beginning, the not doing of any evil, Dhammapada 183. Virtue is the beginning of the dispensation. And that is good because it brings up about the special qualities of non-remorse and so on. Its goodness in the middle is shown by con concentration because of the passage beginning Quote, entering upon the profitable, Dhammapada 183, concentration is the middle of the dispensation. And that is good because it brings about the special qualities of supernormal power and so on. Its goodness in the end is shown by understanding because of the passage, quote, the purification the purifying of one's own mind. This is the Buddha's dispensation, Dhammapada 183. And because understanding is its culmination, understanding is the end of the dispensation. And that is good because it brings about equipoise with respect to the desired and the undesired. For this is said, quote, just as a solid massive rock remains unshaken by the wind, so too, in face of blame and praise, the wise remain immovable. Dhammapada 81. As for the triple clear vision is shown by virtue, for with the support of perfected virtue, one arrives at the three kinds of clear vision, but nothing besides that. The necessary condition for the six kinds of direct knowledge is shown by concentration. For with the support of perfected concentration, one arrives at the six kinds of direct knowledge, but nothing besides that. The necessary condition for the categories of discrimination is shown by understanding. For with the support of perfected understanding, one arrives at the four kinds of discrimination, but not for any other reason. And the avoidance of the extreme called devotion to indulgence of sense desires is shown by virtue. The avoidance of the extreme called devotion to mortification of self is shown by concentration. The cultivation of the middle way is shown by understanding. Likewise, the means for surmounting the states of loss is shown by virtue. The means for surmounting the element of sense desires by concentration, and the means for surmounting all becoming by understanding. And the abandoning of defilements by substitution of opposites is shown by virtue. That by suppression is shown by concentration, and that by cutting off is shown by understanding. 13. Likewise, prevention of defilements' transgression is shown by virtue. Prevention of obsession by defilement is shown by concentration. Prevention of inherent tendencies is shown by understanding. 
and purification from the defilement of misconduct is shown by virtue. Purification from the defilement of craving by concentration and purification from the defilement of false views by understanding. So again, Likewise, he's going, a lot of, he's going through a lot of the Buddha's teaching in a very short time here. This is uh, it's going to be a difficult text for us to read. It's going to be a really challenge to keep up. But uh, well, it's fine to read. You just have to understand that all these lists and, and expositions are referring back to Dhammas of the Buddha. And in fact, like one paragraph of this text you could take and study and think about and take and go and practice. So us reading it so quickly as we are, um, never going to really get at the uh, essence of the text. We might even consider being a little bit, going a little bit slower, taking our time between reading each paragraph to sort of digest what's been said. Because uh, the best way this book is used is actually as a reference, where if you have a specific topic or a specific part of the teaching you want to read, you can just dip in and read a few paragraphs and think about them for a bit, and when you understand them, then take them out to practice or incorporate them into practice. Uh, like, for example, when he talks about through the prevention of defilements, uh, I think this is referring to the three type, three levels of defilement because then he talks about the underlying tendencies. Mm -hmm. so, sila um, overcomes a certain type of, of defilement, which is the defilement of actual expression, where you say or do things that cause suffering for yourself and others. Where he says, um, Purification, uh, through prevention of obsession. I think he's talking about the uh, second level of defilement, which is uh, the mental level, where it, uh, defilements come up in the mind, but you maybe didn't do anything about them yet, but you're angry or you're greedy or you're deluded. And the latent tendencies refers to the potential for the arising of defilement. So, Nothing has nothing has arisen yet. You're you're a good person. You're you're not doing anything wrong. Not even thinking anything wrong. But there's always that potential. As long as you don't have wisdom, there's the potential for the defilements to arise. That's a common, right? A fairly well-known Buddhist teaching. The teaching of these three levels of defilement. And he's going to use a lot of the Buddhist teaching. Just bring it all in here and. Or where it fits in the path. It's very dense, about, as you already said, Dante. So I also think we should just go slow and take more time. And maybe read it again after reading it once. Or not loudly, but just for yourself. Just read it again. Yeah, maybe at least we take a short pause between each paragraph and don't be afraid to ask questions going to take us years to get through this text anyway and we might as well uh, learn something from it and not just be clueless or don't be afraid to ask questions you're not expected to have a high level of dhamma understanding here but unfortunately this text does actually require a high level of understanding there is a commentary for the visuddhi manga also right Bhante? if i remember right uh, there's a yeah, I think it's yeah, called, think a, it's deep called a deep more. Like a sub commentary. Sub -commentary. I don't have the. I, Mark 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 Mark. Mark. I just bought the huge book uh, recently from uh, Buddhist Cultural Center, the Singhalese version with uh, all the uh, uh, commentaries, and uh, it is called Vistra Sanna Sahita Visuddhima. It is a bigger version of it. I don't have it right now. Maybe next week I'll uh, look into it uh, and see if I can add more details. John asked in the ask chat, in the chat. Uh, if the word concentration that keeps getting used here is that from the word samadhi? Yes. Samadhi is most always translated as concentration. 
It might be better translated as focus, simply because concentration implies this sort of compacting of the mind, which I don't think is really accurate. Focus is more uh, because the, even the word samadhi, the 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 root or the base of the word is this the same as the English same, the word same, but it's like uh, balanced. So it implies some sort of balance of mind or or non-disturbance of mind is the idea. Samahita is another word that I think is the same base as samadhi. But it has a sense of like focus when your mind, when, it, when, a, when a, a lens is in focus. Excuse me, when the camera is in focus, then you can see clearly, right? And that's a good analogy for what con what samadhi is. Samadhi is when your mind is finely tuned, not just concentrated in that sense of being, uh, you know, really uh, absorbed in something. So there is kind of that aspect to some types of samadhi. Samadhi is the uh, the focus on something, like when you're focused on something, you don't, not quite the same as being concentrated. It's not a bad word, but yeah, that's what is meant by concentration here is the samadhi. What would be the Pali word then for concentration? For example, if you have too much concentration and something else is lacking, then you get restless, for example. Yeah, but they use samadhi. Oh, okay. Because that does show that there is some sort of fixedness of the mind, not just not just being on talking and focus. I think the ekagata would be the uh, jeta sikha. Right. Well, not the well, jeta sikha, because that jeta sikha is in every, in every, uh, in every, in every, every consciousness. consciousness. Sorry, it would be the jhana factor. Is samadhi always a factor of, of jhana bhante? Uh, I don't think that's the right way to say it. Jhana is um, a type of samadhi, you might say. Jhana is right samadhi. That's the right way to say it. Thank you, Bhante. Continue reading. We didn't have to stop completely. I I wanted to ask uh, actually two questions about um, paragraph eleven. It mentions six kinds of direct knowledge is shown by concentration. No, what does it exactly? Uh, the necessary no, the necessary yes. condition for so the six kinds of direct knowledge. Right. Five of them are supernormal powers. The sixth oh. is the, the destruction of the defilement. All right. Same same paragraph. For with the support of perfected understanding, one arrives at the, and this is the question, four kinds of discrimination. Yeah, again, it's, I mean, these are all just, things that you have to have a high level of understanding to know like theoretical understanding theoretical knowledge of the buddhist teaching to know that's the four patisambhida which are just another really don't be discouraged everyone if you don't know what these things are because it's not that important i mean here he's just giving examples of why or what wisdom is for what ethics is for what sila is for what samadhi is for so you can get a lot out of this even if you don't know what, for example, all of these things are. I kind of know many of them, but I mean, I was just puzzled about these 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 ones. Yeah, discrimination is the translation they use for patisambita. Just for just for sort of um, special qualities of wisdom or special. Uh, types of wisdom or or uh, applications of wisdom, like language is one, the ability, the uh, uh, deep understanding of the usage of, of words. One is Thank conversation, you. the ability to speak or to relate the teaching to others. 14. 
Likewise, the reason for the states of stream entry and once return is shown by virtue. That for the state of non-return by concentration, that for arahantship by understanding. For the stream enterer is called perfected in the kinds of virtue, and likewise the once returner. But the non-returner is called perfected in concentration, and the arahant is called perfected in understanding. So thus far these nine and other like triads of special qualities have been shown, that is, the three trainings, the dispensation that is good in three ways, the necessary condition for the threefold clear vision, the avoidance of the two extremes, and the cultivation of the middle way, the means for surmounting the states of loss, etc., the abandoning of defilements in three aspects, prevention of transgression, etc., purification from the three kinds of defilements, and the reason for the states of stream entry, and so on. I have a question about, there's a lot of um, emphasis on concentration, and there's also, I noticed prevention of obsession, and I'm wondering, like relating to our practice, sometimes I observe that um, like even though I, I, I have mindfulness and I'm noting, it's like they're, the craving, like my mind obsesses over it. And I'm thinking that um, should I, con- like if the concentration were stronger, then I wouldn't let go of that mindfulness. And I feel like that's, that's um, the reason why I'm letting go of mindfulness in those moments is because the craving is so strong that it's like I let go of the mindfulness and I let go of the noting. Is that accurate? Does that have to do with me, need, me, need, me needing to, or one, if, if we make it a general question, um, one is needs to strengthen their concentration in those moments, Bhante? You need to be a little bit clearer with what you're saying and asking. I didn't follow you there. Well, concentration is, uh, if you want to sit, we can go back to these three types of defilements. Concentration is what prevents the arising of defilements in the mind, the arising of the five hindrances, for example. And when you when you reach that state, then you have a clear mind, as we'll see as we go through this text, that should be emphasized again and again. And it's through using that clear mind and applying it to the experiences that there arises wisdom. And wisdom is what what is that which prevents or which removes the potential for the future arising of those very same defilements. So concentration is a temporary uh, stay that prevents uh, that pre- prevents the defilements from arising in the mind. But by saying concentration, we just mean um, the, really the application of or the result of the proper application of mindfulness. So it, it's not concentration the quality of mind concentration as a samadhi is a quality of mind is just one of the five faculties here when they say samadhi or when they say jitta it's referring to the aspect of the path that comes after sila i mean that's what really should become clear through this book through this as we read through this text um the nature of these three trainings, what they are and how sila, what sila is and how, what is the kind of sila that leads to samadhi and what is the kind of panya that leads, or samadhi that leads to panya. 
what is the kind of um, ethics, what is true ethics that leads to true concentration and what is true concentration that leads to a true focus that leads to true wisdom. I don't know if that helps. Do you want to say something, Lily? Oh, I was just to say it did help. Thank you. I want to ask if you could please want to, uh, uh, recap the 15th paragraph. I think we shouldn't continue because it's now after the hour. So just to have a recap of what. Yeah, I think my text is broken. It doesn't show the ending of paragraph 15. Mm -hmm. Then I, I will just ask you. So he is uh, saying these nine and other like triads of special qualities have been shown. So that is the three trainings. Oh, he's okay. Okay, no, my he actually says what what it is. So then, three three trainings. What would that be in recap? Let's see. That's what we've been talking oh, about. The yeah. three sila samadhi panya. And the, so it's all about sila samadhi panya, the dispensation that is good in three ways. And yeah, that's another. Um, way of describing the three trainings as being as being the three parts of the Buddhist teaching that are beautiful. The Buddhist, Buddhist teaching is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, beautiful in the end. And that, again, refers to the three trainings. And the threefold clear vision, is that meaning referring to uh, the result of the training of Sila Samadhi Panya? I think there's a note on that, actually, isn't there? Or am I not I'm trying to look at the text, but I'm looking at yeah, note six. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, so I guess as usual, we'll just read for an hour with all the questions interspersed, and then we'll stop reading after the hour. So that means the second hour will just be discussion and questions. Is the path related to the Noble Eightfold Path? It's not related. It is the Eightfold Noble Path. The Eightfold Noble Path is Sila, Samadhi, and Panya. You can you can uh, condense it into three parts as well. So That's pretty much what's being talked about here, right, Pante? Yeah. Thank you. I have a question um, about concentration. Even though you have expounded it, five minutes before. So in our practice where we note uh, uh, of noting, uh, how, how is the samadhi experienced? Like it's momentary, I assume. Yeah, it's momentary. Okay. Thank you. But it, it has to be momentary. That's the, in the end, you, when we get to the many many moons from now when we get to the third uh, section of this text, we'll see, uh, he points out that in the end you have to, you have to use momentary concept. He actually mentions it here. He says there's no, and it's a quote, or he, he quotes the commentary to this text, the sub-commentary, saying there is no Vipassana, no seeing, no clear vision without momentary concentration. So it has to be momentary. Why? Because well, reality is momentary. The only way you can get more than momentary concentration is by focusing on something conceptual. Because that's the only thing that lasts longer than a moment. But then you don't get to see the three characteristics, so you have to switch to focus on ultimate reality. Ante, if we... um. When we meditate, um, if the perception of the breath keeps coming up in the nostrils, is there? Do you have any recommendations for how to ignore it, or should we just note it and then come back to the stomach? Is something um, I asked. Yeah, um, you shouldn't ignore anything. Just note it and go back to the stomach. So just the physical sensations of feeling, feeling. I guess it's because, thank you, Monty. I mean, it, it seems like 
what I wanted to say is um, it seems like my perception of the rising and falling or, I mean, yeah, just the stomach is changing a lot. Um, yeah, I guess it's getting a little unclear, but I'll just, I'll just keep coming back to it. Because for some reason, my mind um, started, um, it just sees it a lot now. And it's just, yeah, I guess I'm just worrying a little bit too much about it. But, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, you cannot worry, you cannot uh, the reactions to the uncertainty of the stomach. That's the whole point of focusing on the stomach is because it's unpredictable. Changing. Ubuntu. Yeah, still about paragraph 15. I think maybe you talked about it, Monty, already, but uh, what is the difference between abandoning of defilements in the three aspects and purification from the three defilements? Um, yeah, but that's it. But it doesn't say in the three yeah, I'm aspects. trying to do this all on my phone, and this makes it really difficult. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a computer here. Uh, this text specifically because it's not well formatted um, and it's late in the day and I've been teaching all day so just give me a second here yes, yes. I think the abandoning of well no so sorry this this paragraph is talking about what he's is recapping what he's already talked about I think so this that abandoning of defilements in three aspects refers to an early par the earlier paragraph that I actually talked about in detail i think so the transgression is the the physical manifestations of defilement physical and verbal etc and the other two the mental defilements and then the potential for defilement and then this is what he's already talked about the next thing he talks about the purification for the three kinds of defilements you can scroll back and find that yes i remember now you explained it i couldn't follow everything when we read it, so I will go read it again when we are done. But thank you, Bante. Yeah, it's not easy because it's not all in here. There's a lot that he expects you to understand, expects you to, to know from your study, your copious study of all the Buddhist teachings. I mean, this is um, this was this was made uh, in response. This text was written in response to a demand. To to, uh, to prove that uh, Buddha Gosa had a, a perfect, a good understanding of the Buddhist teaching and was able to sum up the Buddhist teaching. You can read the introduction to this text if you want to learn the, the recorded origin story of this text. Yeah, I also think it would have been great if we read the introduction. So, you know, the background of Narendra uh, Buddha Gosa. That's just because it's about Sri Lanka. That's why you're saying that. <laughs> and of course, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> and I have, I, have a, I have a question uh, regarding the previous statement, Bhante, regarding uh, the statement you made about uh, momentary concentration. Would you say that... Uh, uh, Parasamapati would be the exception uh, to that rule, since uh, it is uh, lasting a period of time. And uh, you are well, Parasamapati, Parasamapati is, is not not not, not uh, uh, because Nibbana is the object, it's, right? It's, and it is permanent. It's not. It's not. It's not part of vipassana. The statement is that there's no vipassana without kanika samadhi. But Pala Samapati is already uh, past Vipassana. It's already super mundane and it is jhana, it's jhana. absorption. So yeah, it's a different kind of concentration for sure. Vipassana is about seeing the three characteristics, impermanent, suffering, and non-self. And Nibbana is not impermanent or suffering and it's not really, it's, it's not, I mean, the, the three characteristics are what lead to Nibbana. Seeing of them clearly is what leads to the cessation of suffering. But Palasamapati is the cessation of suffering. It's the fruit. It's the result of practice. It's not practice anymore. 
Remember, this is the pan we're talking about. That's fruit. Got it. Thank you, Ivan. So I put my question in the chat. It's basically the whole paragraph of 14, the 14th paragraph. Um, and I mean, I find, found it very fascinating where uh, he describes basically the Sotopana and the Sakadagami, basically um, their enlightenment showing up in virtue, virtue, for example, and that the non-return. So I, my question is that, uh, so is like it seems here that the non-return is already has to like be pretty good in concentration. Is that is that correct? The statement is that uh, the anagami is one who has perfect concentration. Yeah. Before that, their concentration is not perfect, and that's understood by the fact that they still give rise to. Loba and those that. Mm -hmm. It's not even really fair to say that an anagami has perfect concentration, I don't think, because an anagami still has udacha, right? Yes. But uh, so, so I I guess the question is, Vante, is like you have to perfect the concentration before or it will kind of happen after you become a, an No, uh, he's, just, he's just saying this. It's just this is just his way of saying. It. I mean, it's a very valuable statement, but you just uh -huh. can't see it too technically. It's not technically true. So then, I guess, like my own question would be for for the for the path of non-return. Uh, do you have to like pretty to cultivate concentration to a higher level? Yeah, I think you might be. Uh, Confusing the, the, the usage of the word. I don't know. I'm, I'm not really sure what you're asking. I wouldn't read too much into that statement. It's valuable to appreciate the difference that the anagami is, has done something very profound by completely eliminating the potential for greed or anger. I'm sorry, for sensual desire and aversion to arise. Mm -hmm. Um, and that a Sotapanna likewise has done something very special by having purified the five precepts. But that an Arahant has done something special beyond all of that by completely eradicating ignorance about the Four Noble Truths. Okay. I just, uh, I mean, I think I, I read that in, um, in the Manual of Insight as well. Uh, Venerable uh, Sisayada saying that an anagami has to be quite proficient in concentration. I mean, no. So the pre preliminary path to, to the non-returner is like you already have to be pretty proficient in concentration, basically. If that's correct. Like, I, I mean, I think it's correct. Well, those, I mean, those are just words. It's just talking. It's just a description. Mm -hmm. the practice stays the same. Of course, an anagami has everything better than a sotapanna or a sakadagami, yes. including concentration. Thank you, Bante. So I see the words is shown by again and again. It's a it's a phrase that's it's employed uh, throughout this text. Uh, in reference to sila samadhi, concentration, virtue, and understanding, um, I'm not really used to the the way that they're using uh, that phrase, um, so I'm not really catching what exactly they're trying to say. I, I I see it as kind of maybe like cause and effect, like this is this is the result of this, or this is I I I really don't understand it. It's just maybe kind of archaic to me. Could you maybe paraphrase to elucidate or clarify what is, how exactly that's being used? Uh, it's, an, it's an equivalence, not a cause and effect thing. So for example, oh, okay. purification from the defilement of misconduct 
is uh, represented by virtue. Virtue represents the purification from the defilement of misconduct. Okay, that's clear. Thank you. I don't know what the poly is. I'm trying to think now what... Uh, um, yeah, the word I think is, if I got it right, yeah, Pakasita, okay, is uh, manifested, made known. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a lot clearer for me. Thank you. So, John asks, states of loss, is that referring to the ro lower realms? I think it is, yeah. Yeah, sorry, just hold your question for a second. Yeah, the states of loss, because virtue, the five, the Sotapanna, who has perfect virtue, will never be reborn in the states of loss. So it's virtue that uh, represents the means for surmounting the states of loss. Uh, as for sense desire, when one has perfect concentration, or as, as he calls it, perfect concentration, then they're never born in the sense, sensory realm. So an anagami is never reborn in the gamma, which are uh, the, 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 sense, the sense, realms of sense desire. So that's a way of understanding why an anagami is said to have perfect concentration, because they're reborn in basically a jhana-type state, uh, a pure, hindrance-free state. And uh, the means for surmounting all becoming is represented by wisdom, because when one has perfect wisdom, then there is no rebirth whatsoever. What was the next question? I was just going to say that I didn't think this is so dense. I mean, I think I I did read the. I remember you when when I was doing the instructor course. You you said, I mean, I was instructed to read certain paragraphs, but uh, this in like in the beginning, I think it's more dense than how they just describe the nyanas. Funny thing is that this text is an extrapolation in many ways of an of a dense of a of an actually dense text. So if you think this is dense, you should mm -hmm. see what it's trying to expand upon. The Patisambhida Maga, that's almost unreadable. Same for the Abhidhamma, right? And I think the Abhidhamma is a bit different. This is, this is a commentarial text. So it's trying to explain, it's bringing up various, like this part especially is bringing up a verse and then explaining the verse word by word in some cases. Like you notice how it even defined the word bhikkhu. This is a common, this is exactly how many of the commentaries are for are uh, formatted. But I think it's actually just the introduction, which is um, most especially difficult to read because it's just introducing you to everything or mo most of a lot of the Buddha's teaching in one place but now we are going to read uh, each paragraph uh, each topic like uh, sila has one one whole um, i don't know how you call it but i think it's going to be more clear like he's reading uh, explaining more about one topic than dedicating more text uh, it's pretty it's pretty dense I think we shouldn't rush through it. Yeah, I was not implying to to rush uh, through the following. I still, I still want to take a moment to appreciate how, like, how deep of an understanding they had back back in the days. I mean, I'm just in awe, to be honest. Like everything. I mean, I would have thought. Previously, when I wasn't into Buddhism, that um, like ancient uh, civilizations or in ancient uh, people were not that knowledgeable, and I mean they they knew so much. I'm I'm just I'm just so 
profoundly inspired, I guess. Like this is I remember reading in in high school, we were sort of taught, I think it was even like made explicit that the the ancient Romans or Greeks had a very primitive understanding of reality. They thought the world was made up of four elements. So they had a very primitive understanding of, of reality. And after learning about Buddhism, I think, wow, they they really, uh, that wasn't a primitive understanding. They probably got it from Buddhism <laughs> or, or just general appreciation of the actual nature of the physical world. Yeah. I mean, we think that we know so much, but yeah, we just, I mean, I, f- I feel so small right now. <laughs> And we mostly rely on you know, machines and external stuff. So it makes sense they had sharper minds back then. Imagine Budagosa writing this three times in a row. It's incredible. I'm going to read John's question. I'm came up, I came across another book when preparing for this session called Vimuttimaga. How does that text differ from this one? It's a different text, not really, near, not nearly as well appreciated, um, but I guess it does purport to lay out the Buddhist teaching. I don't know. You should read the introduction to that text, or there, I'm sure there's internet articles about the, about it. Just a different text with a fairly similar name. It's still Theravada, right? I think basically, yeah, I think so. I'm not sure. I think um, the Theravada is more defined by this work, the Visuddhimagga. Um, To be honest, I think it was a very similar question that was just asked uh, by John. It was also about the Vimuttimagga. But yeah, it's understand it. Predates the Vasudhi Magra by four or five hundred years or thereabouts. So I was just wondering if Bhante had um, a view on the sort of relative merits of the text. I think it might even be mentioned in the in the introduction to this text. I think there might even be a discussion of it in the, in the introduction. You can, um, but you can look it up and you read about it if you're interested. It doesn't really have any relevance to this text. I, I mean, there may be some discussion of borrowing from it, but I don't think very much. Can we still speak a little bit about what exactly is implied by the line of prevention of transgression? Gone over it twice now. That's referring to the actual expression of verbal or physical defilement, physical expression of defilement. So again, the, 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 the problem with kind of reading the English um, it sounds like he's presenting a topic and you think, well, why doesn't he talk about it? But he's actually referring to a very specific teaching of the Buddha by its heading. Uh, and that's what he does a lot here. It's uh, like he'll, he'll, he'll use a word and you'll think, well, why doesn't he explain that word? Because it's actually referring to a very... Sp- it's a term. It's not a word. It's a term, and it's a, 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 sp- a term that has a specific meaning. So he's referring to the three levels of defilement: the expressive, the mental, and the latent. Thank you, Bhante. Yes, Bhante. Um, so I was finding when meditating that the verbal noting in my mind, a phenomenon as they arise can at times become somewhat clunky feeling. Um, And I was wondering if it's appropriate after a certain point to simply note what's occurring without assigning a word or a phrase to the phenomenon. The noting is giving you clarity it's keeping you focused and keeping you present and that's why you're seeing whatever it is you're describing as clunkiness but that clunkiness is a state of mind it's qualities of mind and they should be noted 
I mean, these aren't build, these aren't uh, construction blocks that can be clunky or whatever. They're 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 just thoughts. So clunkiness is that's your description of something real. So you have to look and see what it is. The whole point of doing it is so you can see the way your mind works and doesn't work and causes stress and suffering. That sounds like a sort of a stressful state. Must be caused by something. All right, well, sorry, we're not really concerned by what it's caused by, but we're interested in seeing it and seeing what it causes, how it can cause judgment, and maybe you're worried about it or, or uh, unsure whether it's right to continue noting because that has happened. Right? We react to things when they happen. We react to events. And that's what we're trying to change. We're trying to remind ourselves, hey, it doesn't mean anything. It just is what it is. It's arisen. And it's, it's strange, which shows impermanence, because it wasn't like this before, and now it is like this. It's unsatisfying, because not only is it unpleasant, but I can't fix it. I can't make it go away or make it stop. And, yeah, it's not under your control. Does it, It's not you or yours. It's not self, because it's not under your control. It's not the way you want it. Hmm. Could, could I ask a follow-up question? Is that okay? Sure. It's just when you spoke of that sort of unsatisfactoriness, I think that captures it well. But that seems to almost extend to everything eventually, you know, even after the meditation session formally might have ended. It's just everything seems unsatisfactory and that can feel quite disturbing sometimes and I'm not sure is that is that the point I guess is the question that I'm wondering um, I'm not I'm not sure how to sort of relate to that when it does occur well, the, the point is that it's disturbing because of clinging and that if you weren't attached to any of that or wishing it for it to be different, for example, or wishing for it to stay or, or whatever, then it wouldn't disturb you. It wouldn't be suffering. This is the idea of uh, this very powerful word that's always overlooked, or that I think is quite overlooked. Anisito Javiharati, the Buddha says, we dwell independent. In the practice of mindfulness, one dwells independent. So the goal is that you are no longer requiring for things to be satisfying or pleasant. Your happiness is independent, is not to, not reliant on, on consequences, not reliant on certain situations or particulars. Thank you, Matthew. And then the, the goal isn't that you should feel horrible and miserable and unhappy because everything is suffering. It's, it's that you see that you're only miserable because you're trying to find happiness in things that are never satisfied. That the, the seeking out happiness in circumstances is, is what causes stress and suffering. So the way it goes is you you do tend to suffer through meditation, not because of the, not that meditation is is a pleasant or a cause of suffering, but because it shows you um, the unpleasant nature of things. And by seeing that, by seeing yourself um, creating suffering again and again and again, you start to get tired of that. And so it, it, meditation can be at times you know, very unpleasant and repeatedly unpleasant and unpleasant for the long periods of time until, you know, and as a result, gradually your mind starts, your attitude starts to change. Instead of reaching out, grabbing for things or holding on to them or trying to fix them or trying to control them, you start letting go. But you let go as a result of seeing suffering. I remember the first noble truth, the, the Ask to be performed is to fully understand, comprehend suffering. And you read, um, I think he, he meant one of the verses he quotes here: uh, the, the, "All formations are are impermanent and suffering, 
and all dhammas are non-self. When one sees this with wisdom, then one becomes bored or sorry, one becomes tired of suffering. Disenchanted, I think, is the word they use. Nibindati dukhi. One becomes disenchanted in regards to suffering, like just fed up with it or tired of it or had enough of these things that are not happiness. Then there is the freedom. Baba, just a question about your question. Uh, you wrote in the chat to drop verbal noting during meditation, but you mean you say out the words loud? Or did I misunderstand? No, so um, just in my mind, but in the oh, form sweet. of a word. Okay, okay. Yeah, there's I no understand. other way to do it. I mean, it's it's like mantra meditation. You're either doing mantra meditation, you're either saying the mantra or you're not. The only other way is to just be aware of it or know it or something like that, which is far too uh, vague and whatever the opposite of concrete is to really be considered meditation. It's certainly possible that someone without using a mantra could become enlightened, but you need to have very special and advanced faculty. This, uh, the mantra is, well, like any mantra meditation, it's a tool that's you know, widely accepted as creating clarity, as being a concrete technique, as leading to concrete results, like actual... <laughs> verifiable and uh, direct results. But I remember you uh, speaking about um, during comp if we contemplate the hindrances without coming back to the breath too much, the the attention can become too diffused. Even if we, I mean, obviously I, I just thought about it because you say that if one is using the mantra that the attention is more concrete, um, but do you have any recommendations um, as far as to, I don't know, I, I, fi I find that that is something that I struggle with in my practice, um, I guess knowing kind of the, how to gauge, yeah, a state of, of clarity i mean i guess in, in in the end it just comes down to continuity but yeah i still i still struggle with um just the attention becoming too diffused meditation is a struggle where would be the point otherwise challenge your challenge taken out of your comfort zone The only way you let go. Thank you, Martin. I think uh, I, I want to be clear that uh, ho hopefully, hopefully, this uh, this reading of this text can be to some extent practical and not too bogged down in the theoretical. And so, if we take time reading the verses and we try and uh, ask ourselves how this helps me in my practice, then it can be less of a theoretical exercise and more of a reminding exercise, right? Because we just read about sila, samadhi, and panya, so that we should uh, we can, we can make that about our practice, reminders of these things. And I know there's a lot that's uh, that's just you know unfamiliar and you have no idea what he's saying there. But you know even that is okay. Um, I don't think we need to puzzle out what every uh, part of each paragraph is. Different people have different levels of theoretical knowledge, and so they'll be able to pick out more that way, but it doesn't by any means mean that they'll get more out of it uh, practically. So we should remember this tonight's session, most importantly, as a, a celebration. Maybe that's the wrong word, but a appreciation of uh, the three trainings and an appreciation of the class and a reminder of the necessity of these three things and how, how important they are and how he's making clear that they're important in so many different ways 
and they are the cornerstone of the Buddha's teaching in various different ways, as he points out. But that's the great thing about uh, our specific Vipassana practice, right, Mante? Because it's universal, uh, and we can read about most of the stuff in the text, and we can always uh, refer back to our practice because it's connected. I mean, except for oh, except you're for the change part. your you're gonna change your tune when we get to the second section <laughs> because. I was going to say that most of the second section does not apply to our practice. It's quite, some of it does and can be uh, used to sort of, you know, auxiliary practices, but most of that, yeah, a lot of it is not that applicable. Yeah, but it's still a great support. Well, and one of the great things it does is, is help us put that in its, put that sort of practice in its place and appreciate the limitations to actual samatha practice, but also the existence of samatha, because there are groups of people who deny the existence of meditation that doesn't lead to wisdom, saying that, oh, all meditation, wisdom and tranquility have to come together and no such thing as meditation with just tranquility. Maybe that's not what people say. Maybe they just say that it's not a part of the Buddhist teaching, and well, that might be so. But um, it's useful to see that there indeed is meditation that is very conceptual in nature and useful for that tranquility that it brings as a sort of a base, and also useful for the special powers of mind that it brings, apparently being able to read people's minds. I've met people, meditators, who were able to uh, do something very close to read minds. It's kind of scary, actually. Yeah, I remember you talking about um, Burmese scholars, that um, apparently it was normal for them to, or yeah, by their standards, to memorize like the whole to pit Tipitaka. Um I guess because you made mention of it because um, um you were mentioning the venerable venerable Mahasi Sadaiwa but Sayada but talking about how he wasn't very scholarly, like more meditative, but he was very well learned. But yeah, I just found it I found it interesting how you said that. That there were there were people in Burma that were so mind boggling in their in their studies. Um, I'd just like to say that I I really appreciate this group, and I feel really inspired um, just by being able to be here and listen. And I just wanted to thank you. Thank so thank you all so much. Sadhu, thank you. It's great we have so many people here. Um, I assume it's going to be a challenge for many people to uh, to keep up. Uh, if you don't have a background in Buddhist studies, you might find it discouraging or overwhelming or think, oh, this isn't the sort of text that I want to be studying. And I think that's perfectly reasonable. There's no reason that everyone has to put themselves through the study of this text. Uh, that being said, I think we can make make it a light reading, a lighter reading than it would be otherwise by, again, just not worrying too much about the details and trying to uh, appreciate it. Mean, there's many stories in this book and appreciate the, the basic principles and the things that we talk about, the questions that we bring up, and uh, I'll try to point out as much as I can. We've got other people here who are quite book smart as well, who can help. And since it's not like in the Majjhima Nikaya where we had each sutta after sutta, we can, one of us volunteer, volunteers can just um, look through the next session and um, take uh, a part where we are going to stop because otherwise we would, uh, we, there would be no clear ending. Because next um, chapter is going to be a bit longer, and so we can stop at a, an appropriate time. We have time to read and digest everything. 
and next time continue where it's a good point to read again. Continue reading. I think we'll just stop after an hour. Uh, oh. and no, no pressure to get through any amount of. I don't think we should have the pressure because it's not not going to work really. There's you, you'll lose all the comprehension if you try to rush through it, right? So if people have questions, let's just. Uh, we may never finish reading this text, and that's fine, I think. All right. Yeah, I, was, I yeah. meant that we could read something that is uh, realistic, realistic for one hour and uh, include the time that would be reserved for questions. But yes, I think that would be too much, too much thinking and planning. We might all, we might all be dead by the time with this text <laughs> come to the end of this text, and that's yeah. okay. I'm going to cut it there. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Again, it's great to see so many people coming out and I do hope it wasn't too discouraging. The, it's a daunting challenge to to study this text, but uh, Buddhism is full of challenges and hopefully we're up to it. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu. All right. Have a good week, everyone. Bye.